This is our second sitting uh, in basic fit, talking about issues of tahara, purification, and issues of the prayer. And we talked about the last time we talked about the shurut or conditions for prayer, uh, which we said were nine. We said uh, tahara, you know, uh, purification. We talked about covering the body, sitar al aura, uh, the intention, the niya, the the hula wakt, meaning the time, time for prayer, that you pray in the time of prayer, facing the qibla, of course. Uh, also, the other conditions that relate to the person who prays, uh, that they're Muslim, Islam, that they have uh, intellectual capacity, and that they are mature, that they are mature. Uh, you know, they've reached the age of balug, uh, age of puberty, puberty. And then for women, that they are not on their menses, and they are not, uh, they don't have nefas, which is uh, postpartum bleeding. So those are the conditions for prayer. One of the most important conditions for prayer that we're going to talk about, and that we find expanded on by the Fuqaha, the scholars of jurisprudence, in their books is purification. Because we need to know what kind of water we can use, what uh, is, uh, how do we purify ourselves, wudu, ghusl, these kind of issues. So for the sake of being concise, and really this is very beneficial, is Imam Fouzan's book, Malakis Thaqiyya, which is, uh, the concise book of uh, jurisprudence by Imam Fulzan, which is translated in English and is fantastic. And the reason I say this is because, for one, for the English-speaking audience and for the general Muslims around the world, uh, it's much more difficult to teach classical books, books of the Salaf and books of the uh, classical scholars. This is written in contemporary language and the form of the way it's written and the way he presents the issues of fiqh uh, is very simple and is, is, is so beneficial for us. So I found that this is going to be the most useful and we'll go ahead and get started. So purification in water. So this is one of the shurut, one of the conditions we talked about, which is purification, a tahara, that you have to have tahara. This is a shart of salat. This is a condition for salat that you have to be Pure, that you, meaning you have to have wudu or you have to be on ghusl for a prayer. So he says, prayer is the second pillar of Islam. After the testification of faith, as we mentioned, the shahadatain, prayer is what distinguishes Muslims from disbelievers. It is the cornerstone of Islam, and it is the first thing one is questioned about when called to account on the day of judgment. Therefore, if it is correctly performed, thus accepted by Allah, all one's good deeds will be accepted, but if rejected, so will all one's good deeds. So this is why it's so important to know tahara, to know purification, to pray properly, to have a correct intention. Because if your prayer is uh, jammed up or your prayer is incorrect, all your deeds are going to be messed up. Especially if your prayer is not accepted by Allah. If you don't know how to pray properly, you don't know how to wash yourself properly, that's everything in your song. Similar to the way that the one, of course, if their aqidah, their creed, which is called fiqh al-akbar. The scholars like Imam Abu Hanifa, he referred to what was called fiqh al-akbar. And he has a, a classical text. He's one of the salaf, one of the four imams, the first of them. He was a tabi'i. And Imam Abu Hanifa, he said he had a, a text that's called fiqh al-akbar, which means the greater fiqh. Letting us know the greatest thing is is aqidah, is knowing how to, is knowing tawheed and, and these issues. That's fiqh al-akbar. Fiqh al-asghar is what we're studying right now. We're studying the jurisprudence, mu'amalat and ibadat, as we talked about before. Uh, worship, the fiqh of worship, and the fiqh of of uh, transactions, social transactions. So, he's, he then mentions. Prayer is mentioned in many different contexts in the glorious Quran, stressing its various virtues. Sometimes Allah commands establishing it regularly, and sometimes He demonstrates its merits. At times, Allah shows the reward for establishing it. 
and at other times he associates it with patience, enjoining seeking his help through both uh, patience and prayer. Wasta'inu bi sabri wa salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wasta'inu bi sabri wa salat. And seek help with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being patient and prayer. So that lets us know how important it is to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his support and help and assistance with whatever we're trying to do. Wasta'inu bi sabri wa salat. And when you're having difficulty. He says, hence prayer has been made the comfort of the eyes of Allah's Messenger وسلم, in this world, as it is the ornament of prophets, the sign of righteous servants, and the connection between servants and the Lord of the worlds. Prayer, in addition, prevents immorality and wrongdoing. So this is very important, that when your prayer is sound, when you have a good prayer, it helps to keep you away from sinfulness. So the more you indulge in sin, the more you really need to question your prayer. Is my prayer really, am I really praying properly? Uh, because a lot of times we find that we're doing a lot of sin and that's a sign that our prayer is either maybe not accepted or it is weak. We have a lot of shortcomings in our sins. The Sheikh then says, he says, prayer is not deemed valid unless one performing it is in a state of both minor and major ritual purity as much as possible. So that means Tahara uh, uh, tahara, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the ritual purity, uh, the minor and the major purification. That a person ha is uh, purified from hadith al asghar wa hadith al akbar, the major and the minor ritual impurity. Had, uh, we'll talk about that more in detail, but uh, hadith al akbar or hadith al asghar. The minor impurities is things like passing gas, urinating, defecation, things like this. This is Hadith, hadith al Asghar. We'll talk more about that later. Hadith al Akbar, the major impurities, is things like men menstrual bleeding, bleeding from menses for the women, um, and the Kramakum Allah for. Ha, uh, basically ejaculation Allah. these kind of things these are the major impurities okay this is major impurity Imam Fulzani says the means of purification for prayer is either water in evolution or clean earth like in Tayammu dry uh, clean dry earth dry evolu evolution in case water is unavailable so if water is unavailable you can make Tayammu you can make with dry earth. Due to the above, the Fuqaha, may Allah have mercy on them, used to start their books with handling the issue of purification. Since prayer is at the head of the pillars of Islam, following the two, the Shahadatain, it is appropriate to start with handling its prerequisites, among which is purification. So the prerequisites of prayer, of course, is purification. And this is why you find the books of Fiqh the scholars of fiqh, that they began with tahara. They began with talking about water and how to uh, purify yourself in the jasad, you know, the uh, impurities. Because you have to know what is impure, what's pure. What is pure water, what's impure water. How do you use that water then, which is making the wudu and making the ghusl. So these are prerequisites of the prayer, which is a pillar of Islam. So... He said, as is mentioned, uh, that purification is the key to prayer. As mentioned in the following hadith, the key to prayer is purification. This is because a state of minor ritual impurity is like a padlock that hinders one from performing prayer. But once one performs ablution, meaning like wudu or ghusl, that padlock is unlocked. As purification is the key to prayer. Thus, purity is one of the most central conditions of prayer. A condition is to be fulfilled by performing the action stipulating it. Linguistically, as a, as a linguistic term, pure purity means cleanliness and purification from all matters and spiritual impurities. So, as a, in, in the Arabic language, 
this means that it refers to just being clean, cleanliness and purifying oneself. And this can include both the spiritual and the physical purity. Okay, Spiritual purification means, for example, being a Muslim. You, by being a Muslim, you made the Shahada, you have that, what's called Tahara Manu, which is the, uh, like spiritual, you're, you're, is purifying yourself from shirk and kufr, okay? So that's a spiritual purification. And that comes from, not from water and not from dirt, but that comes from the Shahada, from entering Islam and leaving off kufr and leaving off Shirk, leaving off polytheism and leaving off uh, disbelief. And as a Islamic term, it means purification means the removal of ritual impurity as well as impure objects. The removal of ritual impurity can be achieved by using water with the intention of purification. You have to have a niya. You have to have your intention to purify yourself. In the case of major ritual impurity, one uses water and washes one's whole body. That's a Muslim. Yet one only washes the four parts of ablution in case of minor ritual impurity. So if you pass gas, if you urinate, if you defecate at Krama Kumala, then you just have to wash your limbs that you do for wudu. One can use the substitute for water, meaning earth, clean earth, if water is unavailable or dry dust, like if you find dust on the wall. You can use that also for your uh, purification for tahara if you have no clean water, if you have no available water. One can use the substitute for water, namely clean earth, if water is unavailable or one is unable to use it. That's another important point. So one of the reasons you can make tayyambu is either if you don't have water or you cannot use water. So here's a couple examples. Say if you're in a place and you have water and the water is known to have like really bad chemicals, like poison, you know, something that can kill you. It's got a, a real high concentration of deadly chemicals in it that you're going to date it's really going to endanger your life in essence by using it then of course you could make tayyamum it would be legislated in that situation or another scenario is is if you for example you are hiking okay inshallah ta'ala which we hopefully will experience you're hiking or you're camping and you only have so much water so much drinking water we, we only have enough for the day and the night. And if we make wudu, that's going to shorten our water supplies. Maybe we won't have enough drinking water. So in that situation, you can make tayyambu. Okay, because you don't have enough water. Or you only have enough money. Another thing, the, the fuqaha, they mentioned, you only have so much money, you can only buy water. So it's kind of expensive to buy water to make wudu. Well, then you can make tayyambu. Tayyambu is legislated because you don't have to spend your, your money like that. Uh, also, which was the case of one of the Sahaba, Radiallahu where he was fighting jihad and he was wounded in the battle. So, some of the Sahaba insisted that he use water for Tahara. And he used water and it killed him, you know, just because he had so many wounds you know, it caused them to have a, maybe severe infection or whatever. So the water was actually harmful. In that situation, it was legislated for him to make tayyambu. But he made water and he died. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so the Prophet sallallahu clarified to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu that that was incorrect. That he could have made tayyambu and he should have made tayyambu with clean, dry earth. Because then, uh, you know, that would have been safer for him. And as Imam Fuzan said, he said, we will, inshallah, elaborate on how to purify oneself from, from both minor and major ritual impurity later. Let us now point out the qualities of water. It's very important that we know the qualities of water used for purification. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Kevin Kareem, and we sent down from the sky pure water. So the asal of water is that it's pure. 
rainwater, it's pure. That's the purest water you're going to get, is the rainwater and water from the sea and, you know, and rivers and things like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, and sent down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify you. So this rain, you know, it has so many benefits, so many, it's, it's such a ni'mah, and it purifies us, and it purifies the earth, and it, uh, you know, sustains us. Pure water is that which is originally pure and can be used as a means of purification. It is also that water which has not undergone any change, meaning in its characteristics. It hasn't changed in smell, it hasn't changed in taste, and it hasn't changed in color. Whether it is sent down from the sky such as rain, snow, or hail water, running water, such as the water of rivers, springs, wells, and the sea, or distilled water. This is the proper kind of water to be used for removing ritual and physical or physical impurity. However, it is indisputable that if the characteristics of such water changes due to an impure material, it is impermissible to use it for tahara. This is very important. Meaning, if you have uh, rainwater and you are, you know, this good clean water from a river, we go to go to a small lake or a pond or something. And people have been, a better example, because that's a bit more disputable. Instead of the, if it's in the lake or the pond or the sea, then the water, uh, it won't be changed by the najasa, you know, by boo-boo and urine, urination, urination and things like this. But if you have some water, say if we have a bucket and it's full of water and we use it for tahara, and it's next to our toilet, and a karma law, we're using the restroom, some things splash in there, some nudges, and it changes the color just a little bit. It becomes a little yellow and from the from nudges. Can we use that water? No, because now it is changed and it's changed from the jasa. It's changed from impurities. It's changed from either defecation, a karma law, or urine. Those things have changed it. Uh, and they've changed the color slightly. But what if the same thing happens and we don't see any change in the color, but you know a little bit of urine spilled in it, but it has a bit of a smell now. Can we use it? No, we can't. Because now it has changed. One of the osaf, the one of the characteristics of the water has changed from nudges. So it's changed either in smell or it's changed in color. Uh, another thing, Akramakamallah, so what if... Uh, a rat dies in it, we see a rat, and it drowns in our water. And we don't have a lot of water, we have that bucket. And that rat is, you know, it's dead, it's, so it's nudges, mate, and it leaves some stuff in there. But it doesn't leave any smell, we take the rat out, the water looks fine. There's no smell, the color didn't change. And maybe someone says, well, hey, we poured out a little water, let's use it. But then there's a little taste different, a chromical law. Is that pure? No, because it changed from Najasa. It changed from Najasa. It changed from impurities. Uh, then he says, yet it is just a slight change and is caused by pure material. This is the next thing, is if it's a slight change and it's changed by pure material. Uh, it, he says it is permissible to be used as a purifier according to the majority, the stronger view of the two opinions. Because scholars, they differ. So that means if you have some soap and it changes that water just a little bit, it's now a little bit of cloudiness, a little bit of white in there. It's still water. But soap is, is, is a pure subject, a, a pure object. It's pure, <laughs> pure substance, pure substance. It's it's kind of, you know it's clean. Uh, it changed it slightly in color, just a little bit. The the strongest view is you can use it. You can still use that water for tahara, okay, from that soap or something else. If it changed from something else that's pure, you had a little bit of rose water, and you were using it for your face or whatever, and some dropped in in your bucket or whatever. It dropped in your 
your bucket of clean water that you're going to make wudu, uh, and it changed the smell a little bit, just a little bit, it's still okay to use that water according to the stronger view. And Imam Fozan uh, makes, uh, uses the statement of Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, we'll get ready to end up uh, in really quickly. He said, there are many cases in which the characteristics of a little or much water are affected by pure objects, such as potash, I don't know what that is, soap, low tree leaves, dust, dough, and such things that may change the water, because those are all pure objects, are pure substances. For example, water might be put in a pot containing traces of low tree leaves that would affect its characteristics, though the water would not be completely changed in this case. Scholars hold two well-known opinions regarding such cases. So, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said they hold two views. Ibn Taymiyyah then mentions those two opinions with the arguments they are based on. He supports the opinion maintaining that it is permissible to use such water for purification. So this is, I believe, the, the statement of Gozan. He's also saying this. He says, in fact, this is the sound opinion, meaning that you could still use it because it just slightly changed with, with a pure substance. He says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but if you are ill or on a journey, or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself, or you have con contacted women, meaning that you had relations, and do not find water. So if you don't find water, and you have, that shows us if it's Hadith Akbar or Al Eskar, either one, you can make Tayyamum. If you have to make Ghusl for whatever reason, and you have no water, you still make Tayyamum, and that's going to rub al Hadith. That's going to remove the impurities because you didn't have water. And you made your, uh, you purified yourself. Uh, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, comes to the place of relieving himself, or you've contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth, wipe over your faces and hands with it. And that's in Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 6. Water here is in an indefinite noun, in a negative phrase, which in Arabic implies that water in the above mentioned verse includes everything referred to as water in general with no distinction between different kinds of water. That's a very big, strong fa'ida. And especially when you study these issues in the Arabic language, because you'll see a lot of uh, issues that the fuqaha they differed with, and it comes down to understandings and understandings with the Arabic language and looking at the different statements and so on and so forth. And because still, it's defined, we still call that water. If you drop a, pea, a bar of soap in your water that you're going to make will do, and it just changes the smell a little bit, you still call that bucket, you call it a bucket of what? You call it a bucket of water with a little bit of change. You don't say, oh, now it's a bucket of soap. But if you put Kool-Aid, or if you put Vimto, or whatever people drink in different countries, and you put that in that water, that same water, even though Vimto and Kool-Aid and other substances are pure substances, but they change the water totally. Now it's totally purple because of the purple Vimto or the purple Kool-Aid. And now it totally tastes like strawberry. Do we call that bucket a bucket of water? No, we call that now strawberry Kool-Aid or Vimto or whatever the case may be. So it's changed by a pure subject uh, pure uh, substance, and we don't use it. Even though it's pure, but it's not pure to where it can purify, and it's changed in name. That's the point with the Arabic. Imam Fuzan, he then comments, he says, that is to say, Allah has made clean earth the substitute for water as a purifier in case water is unavailable or one is unable to use it. So you can make the yamu if you don't have water or you cannot use water. The way clean earth is used for purification has been pointed out by the Prophet Sallallahu which will be dealt with inshallah ta'ala in a special chapter talking about tayammu. So to create such a substitute for water is a kind of divine mercy from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala which makes things easier for the servants of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says we can have a and if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself or you have con contacted women and find no water, then seek clean earth, 
and wipe over your faces in your hands. Indeed, Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. So Tayyabum is a, is a mercy. It's a ni'mah for us. Ibn Hubayra states, Muslim scholars uniformly agree that purification with water is obligatory for whoever is obliged to perform prayer, provided water is available. In case it is unavailable, one should use the substitute, which is clean earth. In accordance with the Quranic verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and find no water, then seek clean earth. And Allah, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and sit down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify, purify you. This shows the greatness of Islam, the religion of uh, purity, and both physical and spiritual cleanliness. It also shows the loftiness of prayer which one cannot enter upon without being in uh, two states of purity. The first is spiritual purity from polytheism, so that you're a Muslim, and by means uh, of testifying uh, to the shahadatain, sincerely and devotely. The second is the physical purity from ritual and tangible pure impurities, which is performed by means of water or its legal substitutes. We should also know that provided water is still in its original state, mixed with nothing else, it is deemed pure as scholars uniformly agree. Scholars have consensus that as long as it's not mixed, then halas, it's pure. There's no doubt about that. They also agree that if any of its three basic characteristics, its uh, smell, its taste, and color change due to any impure object, then water is deemed impure and it is impermissible to use as it is a me uh, as a means of purification. Yet some scholars differ regarding the purity of water when any of the characteristics has changed due to a pure subject, a uh, pure object. As we mentioned, as we mentioned, soap, vimto, other things like this, they're pure. Uh, the scholars dif differ over if you can use that or not if it's slightly changed the water. One of the characteristics. Yet some scholars differ regarding the purity of water when any of its characteristics have changed due to a pure object, such as uh, tree leaves, uh, soap, uh, or such like uh, pure materials, provided that such a material is not predominant in the resulting mixture. So, for example, if soap falls into water and it becomes predominant, it's majority soap, then of course we can't use that because now it's soap water, or now it's soap. It's no longer water. We no longer refer to that substance as water, so we can't use it. Above, we can state that water is divided into two categories, pure water and impure water, uh, and uh, pure water, which can be used as a purifier, whether it is in its original state or mixed with a pure object, provided it is not prevalent enough to change the composition of water or turn it into another material or another substance or impure water, which cannot be used for purification from either ritual or tangible impurity. It is also the water, any of the, whose characteristics, odor, taste, or color has changed due to an impure object. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad.